QuickBooks Online 2022 journal entry. Get ready because it's go time with QuickBooks Online 2022. Online in our browser, searching for QuickBooks Online test drive, going into the test drive and looking at the United States version, verifying that we're not a robot. Sample company, Craig's Design and Landscaping Services, holding control down, scrolling up a bit to get to that 125%. We're also going to have the free 30-day trial version open just to look at the business view as opposed to the accounting view. If you don't have access to it, that's okay. We're going to use it more in the second half of the course. Back to the Craig's Design and Landscaping Services, hitting the plus button up top. We're now looking at the journal entry. Now, the journal entry is something that's going to be used if you don't have some other type of data input form to enter a particular transaction, remembering that the design of QuickBooks is to have some form that's going to be set up, a form that will typically be in a particular cycle, the customer cycle, vendor cycle, or employee cycle, to record transactions. So you don't want to just record a journal entry if there's a form related to it for multiple different reasons. One, you want the the journal entry to be entered with the forms because that'll make it easier for the data input to be kind of universal to pass on the data input to other people and to have uh, multiple people be able to do the data input. And two, because the forms are designed to, to have functionality that could be beneficial beyond just the construction of the financial statements by tying the forms together, such as the invoice being linked to the receive payment, the estimate being linked to the invoice, the bill being linked to the pay bill, and so on and so forth. Those things are quite useful for the accounting system. If you've learned accounting in terms of debits and credits, you might have a tendency to want to do everything with journal entries, and you might have a tendency to be leaning towards what happens to the creation of the financial statements and not thinking so much about some of these these important links that are happening within the bookkeeping system like linking the invoice to the receipt payment and the credit memo uh, and the and the credit memos out and the estimates to the invoice and so on so you want to make sure that you're doing that because that's going to be a beneficial thing typically and if you don't have a data input form that's when you default to the journal entry so the typical way i would think about it is what's the financial transaction i want to do is it a normal day-to-day -day financial transaction if it is there will most likely be a form that i can use to do that data input if there is not if it's not a normal day-to-day -day transaction like the purchase of equipment for example then i'm going to ask is cash affected if cash is affected then i could probably still use a check or a expense form or a deposit form and then if cash is not affected and there's no form for it that's when you would enter the journal entry one of the most common ways you would be using a journal entry is the period end adjustments like the adjustments at the end of the month or the end of the year adjusting journal entries we'll get into those in more detail uh, in that section in a future presentation so let's go i'm going to go out of this item i'm going to create then our trial balance let's open a trial balance this time by going to the tab up top right clicking on it i'm going to duplicate that tab and take a look at a trial balance and so we're going to scroll down and say let's take a look at the reports and then let's open the trusty trial balance by typing in trial balance this is the balance sheet on top of the income statement in essence in one report i'm going to keep the date range at 010122 to let's say uh, 123122 so there we have it let's run that report now let's first think about a transaction in terms of what not to do so if i go back onto the right hand side and if i was to say let's record a transaction regarding a sale type of transaction but instead of entering say an invoice i'm just going to be entering then the journal entry i'm going to say i know the journal entry so i'm just going to enter a journal entry and, and just put the debits and credits related to it in place. And we just want to see why this is kind of a problem in general oftentimes. I'm going to put this in there as of January 1st, and we'll say, okay, I know accounts receivable goes up, so I'm going to say accounts receivable is going to be debited, let's say by 1,000, and then we're going to say that accounts receivable is going to affect a particular customer. Let's say this is customer 1. And notice it won't let me record it if I don't put a customer in. So, so QuickBooks is going to try to force us to still add the customer. That's so that the sub ledger will be correctly input. And then I'm going to say, I'm not going to deal with sales tax right now. So I'm just going to basically take the sales tax out of it. The other side I'm going to say is going to sales. So we'll say it's going to go to sales. Let's say sale of products of 1,000. 
And then we also know, let's let's assume there was an inventory item. So I know that cost of goods sold is going to be impacted. And let's just say that was 800. And then the other side is going to be inventory. Inventory. And that's going to be 800. Now, one of the things that you could see right off the bat that's going to be a problem is this inventory line item. They didn't force us to hit the subledger like we did with the customer up here. So that's going to throw off our subledger for the inventory that's one thing that's going to happen it's also not as easy to tie this out if it's not an invoice as i track the invoice i can't really give this to the client the same way i could if it was an invoice right it's just a journal entry although it could be impacting the financial statements in the correct way this is why people that have a financial background an accounting background are thinking of the financial statement and might not be thinking so much about what's going to be the invoice what am i going to be giving to the client in terms of the invoice. How can I tie out the invoice to the receive payment and, and so on. So I could then say, let's say save and close. And then if I go to the trial balance and take a look at this, I'm gonna say, let's rerun this report, closing up the hamburger. And then if I go into the accounts receivable, we got accounts receivable that's going up. That looks correct, but it's with a journal entry. I would expect normally to kind of see an invoice here. If I go back to my prior tab, and I'm going to go down and say, okay, the other side went into sales. So sales went up. Again, the correct input on the financial statements there, but it's done with a journal entry as opposed to what we would normally see in here, which would be a sales receipt or an invoice. That's what we expect to see in here. And then the other side is going to go to the inventory. So if I go into the inventory, then we've got a journal entry for the inventory. So the financials could be correct in that case, but it's not going to affect the subledger. And if I go to the other side, it's in cost of goods sold. There's the 800 in cost of goods sold. I'm going to go back on over. Now I'm, I'm going to make the other report, which is going to be a sub report for inventory. I'm going to go up top and right click on this tab and say I'm going to duplicate this tab. And now let's, re let's look at the inventory valuation summary report. Reports on the left hand side. I'm going to type in inventory valuation summary report. And so we have that here and the bottom line of it, the 59624. And if I go back on over here to the inventory, it doesn't tie out to the inventory here because we entered the transaction, which isn't being picked up in the subledger because we didn't record the subledger. And if we're tracking inventory, that would cause a problem. That's one problem that you know you can have if you try to enter journal entries instead of using the forms that will be in place because QuickBooks will, if you set up the items correctly, have the subledgers be populated properly. Also, if I go back to the first tab and I go down to the sales area and we look at our customer information, close in the hamburger and we're going to go to our customer area and we set up customer number one. If I go into customer number one, notice I have a zero kind of balance here in customer number one and I've got this item but it's basically just a journal entry. And again, I would expect to see it in the form of an invoice. So it's difficult for me to send the journal entry. I can't really send it to the client and say, hey, you got this journal entry form that you need to pay us on. I also don't have the receive payment link that I can basically receive the payment on the journal entry, which is this next step normally that I would enter. And again, you could enter the journal entry related to the received payment, which would be increasing undeposited funds or the checking account and the other side decreasing the decreasing the, the accounts receivable. But then these two won't link together properly and so on. So again, you kind of there's there's issues with entering the journal entry. And this is maybe a fairly exa a common example, but just note that you, you typically want to use the forms because the forms are designed to create the subledgers properly. And so you don't want to enter the journal entry unless you're doing something that doesn't have a form related to it. So, for example, you might have a, a transaction where you're purchasing where you're purchasing equipment and you're financing the entire thing. In that case, there's no real form for it. So you might say, OK, I'm just going to go to the journal entry at that point. Also, just realize, however, that you could enter the journal entry directly into the register. And if people aren't as familiar with debits and credits, this might be the place you could go. If you like debits and credits, obviously the journal entry would be the place to go. If you're not liking debits and credits, then you could go to the register when you're entering, entering journal entries and you think about it like this. You go into the accounting area down below. 
you're going to see the chart of accounts. And normally we think of a register as something that we have just for cash. We'll talk more about registers later, but notice there's a register for everything that's a balance sheet account down to like the equity section at least. So all these balance sheet accounts, if you look at the balance sheet side of the transaction, there's a register to it. So you might be able to enter some transactions directly into the register. This works well if you have transactions that only have two accounts involved in them because one account's going to go up or down. That'll be the one you're going to use the register on and the other account will do whatever it's going to do, debit or credit the other side. So for example, if I went into this one and said, okay, I'm going to, there's a purchase of the truck here. We got another truck or something like that and we finance the whole thing. I could look at the register and say, I'm going to open up the register here and say there's only two accounts affected. So notice the transaction types I have. All I have is a transfer or a journal entry. I can't enter a check into this register. I can't enter a deposit into this register because it's it's a register for the property, plants, and equipment type of account. And if I make this as of January, let's say, January 1st, I could say the payee. I won't enter the payee now. But let's say purchase or finance new car or something like that. And we're going to say this is going to increase over here. So we're going to say this is going to be an increase of, let's say, 10000 And then the other side is going to be some kind of loan, loan payable account that's going to be going up. And that would be the, that would be the transaction because there's only two accounts affected and it'll enter the journal entry. If I save it, then it's going to, it's going to enter that journal entry. And then if I, if I look at that journal entry and go and go and edit it, that will take me into the actual journal entry where I can see the debits and credits. And then usually I copy over the description over here. So it's on both sides. And so that would be a use where we, where we would need to enter the journal entry because there's no actual form to enter that, to enter that transaction. So if I go back to the first tab or the trial balance and I go into this data, I'm going to say, okay, now I entered a journal entry. We had the truck, the truck account here is impacted there's the journal entry if i go into it then i'm going to see the debits and credits related to it notice it doesn't take me to a form because there is no form the last form that we'll go to if there's no other form involved will be the journal entry that's how you want to kind of think about it and then the other side is going to go into that accounts payable liability i'm sorry li loan payable type of account so there is that now if you did a transaction that had multiple accounts that are going to be impacted then the journal entry is also typically something that you might end up using because it's a more complex transaction, but you can't really use the register as easily. You're going to, you're going to most likely need to know the debits and credits in that instance. And that's when you'd, you'd basically hit the drop down and you'd want to go just directly into the journal entry. And then of course, in the journal entry, you've got your, your journal form, you've got your date. It'll journalize giving you the journal number. And then you've got your accounts. You've got your debits, your, cre your credits, your descriptions and then your names over here remembering that if you do anything to an account that's like an accounts receivable or payable account type that has a required sub ledger that's going to break out by customer or vendor then quickbooks will try to force you to put the names in here because they're trying to say hey look i'm going to make you put the data input in such a way that one you're going to be in balance you can't enter anything that's not in balance and two the sub ledgers can still be reported for those main accounts that are supporting accounts receivable and accounts payable, for example. So we'll get into the journal entries and some more complex journal entries when we talk about the adjusting entries at a later point. Notice if you're talking about the day-to-day -day normal data input for the adjusting entries, hopefully the form will take care of those. And that's because and if you hit some of these forms, like the invoice form and the sales receipt forms with inventory tracking and sales tax are actually quite complicated, as is payroll forms that we'll talk about later in terms of the numbers of accounts that are affected. But what we're trying to do is, of course, because those are normal transactions, make it so the data input is as easy as possible. And again, at the adjusting entries at the end of the period, it would be nice if basically those were one of the only things that we use the journal entries for, because the journal entries should indicate to us that we're doing something outside the norm that's not a normal data input type of process. So we'll talk more about journal entries when we get to the adjusting entries.